very happy that you are uh, here. Uh, we will start today with the first session in which uh, Loretta Aniena, officer of CAPS, will explain us uh, the call. Uh, after her presentation, there will be uh, questions and, and answers, so uh, you can uh, ask her. Thank you, Loretta, for uh, coming. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. And when I saw that it's only 41 euro with Ryanair, I said, we could have more people coming. But it's a really like to come also. And it's a pleasure to be in Barcelona. And for me, it's especially a pleasure to be in Fab Labs. Because I did my PhD at MIT, and so this kind of, uh, me, and I worked for the Media Lab for the first five years. So I like being in labs. And my commitment to bureaucrat. Uh, stamping uh, money, giving out money, but I actually love to be in a lab, and it reminds me of Rad Lab. So Rad Lab is one of the structures like this in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but that's where uh, radiation, uh, in, in the first um, um, airplane uh, automatic uh, was invented by the students there. They tested it all in North America, and it was run through a switch in Canada. And for years, all the American telephones went through Canada. So now the situation is all the email goes through some of the big servers of Google. So the situation, history, the more you find out about history, the more you find out that technology is new, but politics is not. So the report I gave out talks about social innovation, which is one of the promises of CAPS. So CAPS is really using technology to make social change. It's about two things, it's about social innovation, which we have several definitions of, but that report talks about how it started and what's the history. Uh, and in terms of the welfare state, what happens when the welfare state cannot distribute services and people have to bottom up, organize themselves to create at those kind of exchange mechanisms that allow you to have a high quality of service at lower cost with a lot more citizen engagement. So citizen engagement is one of the key aspects of CAPS that I'll talk to you. What I will not talk about is sustainability because that's really a big word. And scientists tell me it's almost unthinkable that we can have an impact. But, of course, we, we, we try. So the words there are collective awareness, which I'll go into in great depth, uh, for social innovation, which is a long discussion. So I gave you a report, and uh, give me your card if you want, uh, to, if you want more copies, because I didn't have enough. And sustainability, well, that, uh, you know, is, a, is, is far too big. But what I will talk about sustainability is the EU. So the EU has very strong uh, uh, policies, 40% uh, reduction, 20% reduction. These are very good goals and very difficult to negotiate. But what you know is that these top-down targets are bound to fail. The Lisbon Agenda, which was about spending 3% of our GDP on science R&D for innovation, has so far failed because nobody, well, a few member states, Sweden uh, among them, Finland perhaps, um, Germany come, it is, is spending quite a lot, we have Brown Hofer, which is one of the biggest beneficiaries. So in Europe we would like to have more of these. We would like to have 3% invested in innovation, but it's not happening. So CAPS is about bottom up, trying to make things that wouldn't happen, happen. Now, the, the key words are collective awareness. Why? Because if you try to find, and uh, you will see that our call through the digital agenda, you have to really navigate your ways. It's not easy to find us. But if you just put in those two keywords on a search engine, you'll hit us immediately. So our program location comes first. And this after three years. So that, that's not bad. And the next slide, I push. OK. We're so, yeah, these are some examples of collective awareness platforms. The ones in blue are the ones that are best known. The ones in green are our own, the ones that we funded. 
So collaborative consumption, getting facts or evidence from citizens for citizens. So the electricity company might know very well what the consumption is in your condominium, but they're not going to give it to the one next, next door. But if you ask your neighbor, could I see your, your utility bill? And you see that they spend half what you spend, and the windows are facing the north. Or, then you ask yourself, how can I change my behavior to be more sustainable in my energy consumption? But as I mentioned, there is the politics of who holds the data. So a lot of these things have to do with sharing the power that having uh, information and, and storing it safely and keeping it and privacy. So all of the issues uh, in, are embedded in these applications. So sustainable behaviors and lifestyle, that's green communities. I think we can do a lot more than, than we're doing. Barcelona is, is doing very well, by the way, by my standards. And it's one of the so-called smart cities. There are a number of smart cities that want to adapt these kind of capsules uh, throughout. The difference between smart cities, which has a huge budget and has a lot of mayors and big industries, and our program is that our program is really capillary, small groups, and it's smart citizens, not smart cities. It's how, how citizens can cope with the traffic. So one of our projects, I don't know if it's in there, yeah, Cap for Access, the last one, that actually in the first call got the top marks because it's an open source, open hardware platform like all of the others for special needs people. I myself slipped and, uh, at the swimming pool and uh, have, have a reconstructed arm. So for a while I could, I really, I mean everybody at some point in their life is a special needs citizen. So when you have those special needs, you appreciate how important it is. And for instance, in Brussels, we are redeveloping the metro. There's thousands of stairs that you didn't expect. Uh, so also in Paris, they have a very similar project that it has won prizes because it's open source and it's connected to the electricity. But I tell them, you know, I love your project, but the difference is that that one tells you that the electricity is working. Our project, which is, you know, people themselves, it's a social network, tells you that although the electricity is working, that elevator, you really don't want, you know, is in a mess. That you wouldn't find out from the sensors. You might. But I mean, it's people giving you tips. So it's a bottom-up. The budget is 36. Every it got squeezed. We started with a little more, I think uh, 37 or 36, we'll see. Um, sometimes you can spend a little bit more if you have a lot of good ones, but um, they're taxing some of the budget for what they call horizontal areas, so it's a real fight. Um, and because we have other areas such as cooperation with Japan, I tell the ones who have a Japanese partner, try to get that budget, so we <laughs> top up, anyway. That's, um, that's the, the call text, and it closes the 14th of April, which means that uh, if you want to do a proposal, you really have to get together with other people here, find out what, is, what you need to make a strong proposal, and get in touch with the others. So you really need to use the website and the info day mailing lists, because there you recognize organizations that, that you want to be involved. And I would recommend that we get fewer, stronger proposals. Because last time, one in 10 got through. Actually, we had quite a large number of proposals who had very high marks, but couldn't get funded due to lack of money. Uh, which is why we have, you know, double what we had the last time. Maybe we can even triple by next time, who knows. So these are the words in the call text. Um, real communities. Real communities mean that you don't go out after you get a contract looking for users. You really need to have a community that is eager to do something. For instance, uh, cyclists. 
they're very you know, keen on things, or uh, special needs, or mothers with uh, three young children, people who are in need of something that solves their problem for which social innovation and ICT platforms mostly mobile phones. I mean, we know that mostly the new generation, that's, that's what they can't live without. Right? It's not a desktop type of uh, web service. It's a new kind of service, very distributed. And participatory <coughs> forms of social innovation, of innovation. Um, so you have that paper which analyzes all the results of the first batch of projects. It's, it's not our work. This is an independent uh, expert who, who has written about it, so it's not something that is part of the commission only. But I think it helps you to get the bigger picture. Yeah, grass, grassroots community. So I was in the first evaluation. I think I must have done 50 or 60 of these um, panels, what I forget what they're called, consensus meetings with three experts, one commission person and a rapporteur. And those those projects which were excellent but didn't have users, the grassroots users involved, didn't make it because they lost some points. They thought, well, by the time that they start getting the community. On the other hand, the ones who had a small community, the community could grow quite fast during the projects. Multidisciplinary is a key part of this program. So in fact, like peer-to-peer -peer value, they're very techy, but uh, the coordinator is a sociologist. Um, there are philosophers involved. I mean, uh, it's hard to tell which discipline it is because there is many involved. But not multidisciplinary for the sake of it. I mean, there are programs uh, called uh, Digital Social Science and Humanities or responsible research and innovation that do that, that are really multidisciplinary. We are part of the light part of Horizon 2020. That is, we are internet future type of people, future internet, uh, future GSM, future of um, 5G. We are technology driven in the sense that technology is part of the innovation and it's also aspects of competitiveness. So we really think that these things will create jobs and growth. Perhaps not growth in the sense of banking, you know, not big capitalist growth, but small, small growth that means progress. So uh, value creation models is, is what I'm talking about. There are things that create enormous value. I, I just went to the Van Gogh Museum, but of course he didn't even, he only sold one painting after 10 years of struggling. All he wanted is to make a life as an artist, but so now that creates an enormous amount of innovation. I think in Barcelona, what about Gaudí? I mean, he, he died sort of poor and not, not, not even understood, huh? but look at the effect that Gaudí's uh, Creativity has had throughout the city. It's unbelievable. Very ori original. So motivation, now if you are multidisciplinary, then you know that things like incentives require understanding human motives, motivation, incentives, creating music, creating art. Um, one of my projects is called Web Cozy. It's about, uh, well, SI stands for social innovation. It's about progress beyond GDP. So what happened is that there's an idea that happiness can be measured. And in the last 10 years, I think countries have had their happiness index in addition to their GDP. Why is that important? Well, our GDP is not in the 10 percent or you no. Know, I think Italy's I'm Italian was a bit negative. Huh? Greece was very negative. But even the most positive ones are about 2% of uh, France, Germany. So when GDP growth is not what it was in the 60s, how can we expect to provide the same level of education, of health, of defense, of all those collective goods? You have to find a better way of distributing and creating. One of the things that CAPS is keen on is that it's not just consumption. 
a lot of users are put in projects to consume technologies, to, you know, ever more versions of the technology. You know, how many pixels does it take to create a good image on TV? Well, CAPS is really about sharing uh, knowledge for production. So if you produce uh, guitar work distributed, you have done something that perhaps cannot be measured in terms of a high economic flow, but it is progress and well-being. So the interesting thing about Web Cozy is that you have organizations like Eurostat, which has spent 10 years getting the right indicators, at least 10 years, because I know when I started, we didn't have the right indicators. Now, thanks to the EU, this process is working well. We have excellent statistics. However, these are top-down kind of statistics. These are sampled, these are verified, these are... And at the other end, you have Facebook, Google, right, which has real-time statistics. Yahoo, I visited the, the Yahoo lab uh, down, it used to be down the street, their old lab, and you know, they could put in a keyword and find out, how, you know, who in the world was typing that keyword at that time. Well, these are very important, not just to marketing people who want to sell Coke or drinks or, or football uh, tickets or whatever. These are important because they, they give you a pulse of the city in real time. However, these are not sample data, these are user generated. So the question of how you merge bottom up with top down is a scientific one. And that's one of the projects has the OECD involved. It's going to be presented at the big plenty, plenty, potentially, something in Mexico with thousands of people. And the reason I mention it there to you, or to the people in the Fab Lab also, they're going to have a competition. So my project will have a competition on visualization of data, which means that you use some of the real-time stuff to try to explain to citizens what's happening um, so you can win something there. But again, every citizen, even the older ones, like me or my mother, need to know in real time what's happening in their city. These dynamic maps are very useful. If they're visible and open, you can make a lot of uh, changes in your itinerary or lifestyle if you know what's happening. So visualizing the data that we have is really important. And these are many disciplines that we hope to encourage in tackling the problem. Now I go into the, the little areas of, uh, so the, the, the biggest budget, 24 million, is for pilots, test beds, real cases. And these are some of the texts, well, the, the text, the call text uh, language. Network effects is the fact that with, once you get that first three or five percent, things take off. Like in the apps economy, once you get a few word of mouth people knowing that this actually works, it's free, or, then it takes off. So network effect is scale, it's about scaling up. Yeah, social networks, sensor networks and knowledge co-creation, and these are key words that you might want to tackle in your proposals. Many of our projects are about crowdsourcing and crowdfunding together. That's one called CHEST. So that students with an idea put it in, and I, actually I've seen the competition. They had three goals in one year. It, a bargain, I mean a bargain for us, for the taxpayer, because it's, it's, it's very labor intensive. What's good about that is that when you went on the call, you would see every student with idea. So one was about tagging uh, homeless people, tagging. I mean, you put a tag next to the bridge, and somebody creates a, a restaurant a coupon so that they can have a free meal nearby, in real time, without private, you know, it's not privacy. Nobody has to know their name, nobody. So it, Ideas like that, you wouldn't think of yourself, but you know, students are very good at having crazy, bold ideas, and competitions for the best ones use crowdfunding and crowdsourcing to do that. Part B is the multidisciplinary research. 
which is four million. And that's, these are some of the texts for that. Better understanding of the obstacles. As I said, sometimes the obstacles are political. You'd really have to change some, some of the projects, uh, the one about uh, decarbonate, which is about sustainable consumption. You really have to change the mindset of electricity or utility companies. That's not easy. In the other one, the one I mentioned before about the bottom-up versus top-down statistics, it's a threat for statistical organizations to have people coming up with, uh, you know, uh, bottom-up uh, data about things. And they say, well, it's not sampled, it's not realistic, it's going to change tomorrow. Yeah, there's a lot of issues. So recognizing part of the obstacles that may be political or cultural or bias is, is, is half of the problem. Otherwise, the stuff will not work. Motivations and incentives, I mentioned that in terms of the psychology of, of, of users. Uh, so defining online reputation. Now anybody who has stayed in a hotel uh, knows that it's not just the price or the little point on the map. A lot of what people report happening gives you an idea. And people are very, you know, it's, it, this is spam, huh? because everybody does their own uh, advertising, but people are getting very good at recognizing uh, the, the spam from the real, or the things that appeals to me. So there's a kind of identification and role playing in the internet, and reputation systems are important. And one of the paragraphs that we wrote uh, in the PEPA report, and we wrote, uh, I helped, it's about corporate social responsibility. We think that these bottom-up technologies, if used responsibly uh, and, and truthfully, will create more corporate social responsibility, more accountability, Identity, anonymity, ethics, respond. Yeah, so this is what I talked about. These are the call text. Net neutrality is very important currently with the FCC. Let's hope also here. Uh, non discriminatory access. Now, for me, that's one of the fundamental. I spent uh, my dissertation was mainly about that. No, what is non discriminatory access in common carrier law? Common carrier law comes from the UK. And it says, well, you, when you only have an inn next to the bridge, and uh, the, num, you know, the, inn have, the innkeeper has to decide, do they raise the price knowing that, or don't they? This, this is, this, the, the legislation from medieval times was responsible for all the legislation in the US uh, with the great distribution of grain, and uh, it, it's one of the key legislation. It, it, it fell with cable TV because all of a sudden, the idea was that now you have abundance. When you have abundance of spectrum or, or capacity, then you don't need regulation.